Hello everybody and welcome back. So for today's video, I'll be testing out breakfast from different countries for a week. Most of them being savory and almost all of these were completely new concepts to me. Like I feel like I learned so much. I intended to go the, the more traditional route, though you guys know I, I can't help but improvise a bit when cooking. So these might not always be 100% authentic all the time, but pretty close, I would say, considering they're plant-based. Though I'm sure you're gonna tell me in the comments if your grandmas would approve of this. Ooh, hi. Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring these ideas, by the way. All right, so this first breakfast I got recommended quite a lot. It would be chilaquiles, a Mexican dish consisting of lightly fried tortillas that are coated in some kind of sauce, like spicy tomato sauce or green salsa, for example, and then topped with all sorts of toppings. Let's make that sauce first. To a small saucepan, add some vegetable oil and bring it to medium heat. Add some red onion. If you like, you can keep some of the raw onion pieces for decorations later. Cook the onion for about four minutes or until translucent, and then add all the spices. Now I'm basically just making a spicier version of my enchilada sauce, um, cause that one's just so super easy. So once you've added in all those spices, also add like a teaspoon and a half of maple syrup or sugar to balance out all of the tomato puree that goes in there. Let everything caramelize for about two minutes. Now thoroughly mix in one tablespoon of flour. Give that another one to two minutes. And then add the tomato puree followed by some vegetable broth. Bring everything up to a simmer and then allow this to cook over medium for three to four minutes, three to five. Afterwards, taste test and see if you need any salt. Prep the tortillas next. Cut some corn tortillas into triangles. Cut them in one stack, that makes things easier. Add a fourth of a cup of frying oil to a skillet. Bring it up to high heat. Once the temperature reaches about 180 degrees Celsius, or once you can see bubbles forming around a wooden straw or wooden spoon, uh, then you know it's time to add the first batch of tortillas, enough to cover the entire pan. How long this takes depends on the exact temperature that the oil has. Um, in the beginning, mine took about a minute on each side, and then towards the end, it was more like 30 seconds max. Okay, now the last thing that needs to be prepared here is our beautiful, entirely plant-based fried eggs. In a small to medium bowl, combine everything for the white part first. Sticky rice flour, soy cream or soy cuisine, plain unsweetened soy yogurt goes in here, a pinch of salt, and a teaspoon of rice vinegar. That's it. Thoroughly combine everything until you've got this smooth glaze-like batter. Do you remember that super accurate vegan tomato egg yolk recipe that went viral about a year ago? It uses a mixture of tomatoes and stabilizers and science and a lot of time. I definitely got inspired by that. Um, so my version uses tomatoes as well and that's it. It's just the tips of yellow cherry tomatoes. I gave the skillet that I used to fry the tortillas a quick wipe down first, you know, just getting rid of any leftover burnt pieces. I then added a bit of fresh oil here, not as much as before, just like a tablespoon will do, and brought this to medium high heat. Once it was nice and hot, I added about a heaping tablespoon of the white egg mixture per egg. I used the back of a spoon to spread it into sort of a real fried egg type shape. Quickly add one of the tomato pieces to the center of each one, or you can also go slightly off center to make them look even more realistic. Let these guys cook for about 30 seconds to a minute or until lightly golden brown along the edges. Don't let them dry out too much. Now onto assembling. Add the fried tortilla chips to the tomato sauce and mix that together. 
add that to your plate and then we're gonna cover this in toppings i went for some vegan sour cream homemade cashew cheese some of this avocado our egg oh and and to make the egg white look a bit more shiny I, I brushed it with a bit of sunflower oil but that's just because i was taking about 100 photos of this here's where you could sprinkle over some kalanamak as well if you happen to have that on hand i actually didn't use it i think they're also really yummy plain and the eggs are really yummy as well, like the texture of the egg white is definitely more creamy than a real fried egg, but also less rubbery than fried eggs can be sometimes. So yeah, definitely try this and let me know what you think. Many of you also asked me to try Japanese breakfast. I really, really wanted to make tamagoyaki, which is this rolled omelette that you roll in a really fun and interesting way. I took to the expert here for this recipe, Lisa and her food blog, Okonomi Kitchen. I paired the omelette with some cozy miso soup. And so for that, I first off prepared the seaweed stock just by placing some dry kelp, AKA kombu or konbu, I never know how to say it, um, in a small pot, pouring hot water on that and letting it sit for at least 30 minutes. While the seaweed was soaking, I chopped up everything else that was going to go into the soup. Um, we got some spring onion here. These cute little mushrooms, which I am not chopping, but just cutting off the root. And then I just cleaned them by hand. Some tofu, some carrot. Then I set aside the veggies and got started on my omelette mixture. It's really so easy. All you gotta do is blend up everything inside a blender. Silk and tofu, water, sugar, chickpea flour. Lisa uses mung bean flour, but I just couldn't seem to find that anywhere. Also some rice flour, just regular rice flour this time. Baking powder, nutritional yeast, salt, bit of turmeric for the color. And then I also added a teaspoon of soy sauce. Then I hit blend. Okay, now onto cooking these. Make sure to use a non-stick skillet though. Ideally something like a cut pan. Grease it and turn the heat to medium high. Once it's hot, pour in enough batter to thinly coat most of the pan. Once they're no longer shiny, after around one to two minutes, roll them up. You use a spatula of some kind or perhaps cooking chopsticks. I think Lisa mentions those. Push it towards one side. Grease the pan again and I'll pour in another layer of batter, making sure that it goes a bit under the cooked roll. Leave the omelet again until it's cooked and no longer shiny, and then carefully roll it up, starting with the cooked roll first. And then you do another round. This batter makes for six layers total. After four rounds of rolling though, it seemed thick enough. Um, so that's where I stopped, but you know, you do as many layers as you want. Now let's quickly finish up the soup. After removing the kombu, this is what you're left with. It definitely has a flavor I'm not used to at all. Very intensely, like the sea tasting. I brought this up to a boil, letting it simmer on high for about two to three minutes. And then I brought the simmer down to medium and added the rest of the ingredients. And then I got to assembling. This omelette, you guys, it is so, so good. It really is a lighter breakfast. I could have definitely added some rice here, but yeah, it was super yummy. So someone on Instagram suggested focaccia and cappuccino as a typical breakfast in Northern Italy, but like focaccia dipped into the coffee it sounded sounded interesting but yeah focaccia love focaccia i really wanted to make my own it is like the easiest bread to make in a large mixing bowl combine some lukewarm water like not too hot not too cold something like 43 degrees celsius that's very specific some sugar or agave syrup and olive oil 
give it a quick mix and then sprinkle the dry active yeast on top and let this sit in a warm spot for about 10 minutes. Meanwhile, combine the dry ingredients. I'm using white spelt, vital wheat gluten. It just makes everything more chewy and fluffy, though the gluten can of course just be replaced by more flour. Don't forget the salt. Add this to your yeast mix. Thoroughly combine everything with a spatula until it has this sort of look to it. Drizzle over some more olive oil and then place this into the fridge overnight for at least eight hours, or you can keep this in there for up to two to three days. Now it's early in the morning. Grab a 20 centimeter brownie pan and grease it with some more olive oil. Take the dough out of the fridge. Look at those bubbles. Using a silicon spatula or cake scraper, transfer the dough into the pan. And just leave it. Leave it like so, you don't even have to shape it. Leave it alone, again, someplace warm this time, for two to three hours. Yes, that is a long time, but it's worth it. It's worth it. This looks so fluffy. I deflated that with my hands here. But basically, you drizzle over some more olive oil, and then, and then using all of your fingers, you sort of poke the dough. Lastly, sprinkle it with lots of coarse salt. You can also add some rosemary or thyme here, but since I was gonna have this in my coffee, I, I, I kept it simple and salty. Bake this for 20 to 26 minutes until it's nice and golden brown. Let the focaccia rest for about 15 minutes. In the meantime, either make some coffee or grab some somewhere. It's the perfect bread. This is going to taste best when fresh, so serve it right away. It's so good. It's crispy on the outside, so fluffy on the inside. Dip it into that cappuccino. According to doinitaly.com, the true virtuoso of the Ligurian breakfast can calibrate the right duration of the dip in the focaccia in latte, which must neither be too long to excessively soak the focaccia, but not too short either. I honestly really enjoyed the saltiness of the bread in combination with the coffee. Next up, we have Finnish rye porridge with lingonberries, or Nordic cranberries. I knew this would be something for me. Like, I'd been craving sweet breakfast at this point so much. I couldn't find any rye flakes anywhere, or rye semolina, and so I had to go with plain rye flour as my base for this. I also couldn't find any fresh cranberries, and so I went with cranberry comp compote instead. All right, here's a quick organic store haul. Now onto the recipe. To a small saucepan, the heat turned off. I'm adding the rye flour and some salt. Then I'm adding some non-dairy milk, a fourth of a cup at a time. So I'm slowly mixing in the milk to avoid as many clumps as possible. The mixture might still clump a bit in the beginning, but that's okay if you just whisk it enough. You're gonna get it to be smooth. Bring this to a quick boil. Whisk as fast and as thoroughly as you can. Turn the heat down to medium and let it simmer while continuing to whisk for a good three minutes. Then add your cranberry compote, compote, I don't know how to say this, <laughs> and, um, or cranberry jam. At this point, I was again thinking about the photos, as I do, and so I thought, you know, it would be fun to add some, some red color to this. And yeah, so this is absolutely not necessary at all. I let this mixture continue to simmer over medium for another five to 10 minutes, stirring every once in a while, just making sure to get rid of that raw flour taste. In the meantime, I made myself this cozy little drink. Yeah, the, the porridge is a bit more on the liquidy side. Just let it sit for another five minutes as it's cooling off. It thickens up even more as it's just sitting. 
I top this off with some soy cream and some green apples. I have found myself having breakfast on my floor a lot lately, probably because there's a window and a radiator. So the next day, Friday, I was heading home to see my family and so I didn't have time to film, but if you care, for breakfast I had some oat milk, a banana, and some of these Christmas cookies. A full vegan English breakfast is made up of lots of different components that I already have recipes on, um, but I don't think I've ever had everything together in that constellation. My rice paper bacon, for example. Those sausages here are made out of tofu and oats, but they do not taste like soy or oats. I fried these next to some tomato slices and mushrooms, and as for the baked beans, I just opened the can and warmed those up. And the eggs you've already seen me make on Monday. Serve everything together with some toast. This is really good. Traditional Indian breakfast varies depending on where you are in India, but it seems to be more so on the savory side. Like oftentimes there's lentils involved, breads or rice cakes, crepe-like pancakes, and all kinds of sauces or chutneys. So I picked two southern Indian dishes to try out. Um, dosa or dosha and sampa. Now I think that traditionally you let the rice and lentils ferment, but that seemed a little intimidating. So I went with a super simple three or four ingredient instant dosa that I'm absolutely obsessed with, I have to be honest. All you gotta do is combine rice flour, semolina or rava, salt and water. The batter is going to be quite watery, Set that aside for about 15 minutes, and then you just go ahead and brush a non-stick pan with a bit of vegetable oil. Bring that to medium high or even high heat. And once the oil is hot, you grab your dough, give it another quick whisk because the semolina is going to sink down to the bottom, and then just add a ladle or two for each dosa. Let the batter crisp up until golden brown for about two minutes on each side. These are so good, especially dipped into the lentil stew, or with Nutella, apparently. The preparation for this started the night before. You're gonna need some tour dal, apparently called pigeon pea in English. Basically split yellow lentils, which I first washed and covered with water to let them soak overnight, because I had a feeling these would take a bit longer to cook if you don't have something like a pressure cooker. The next morning, I gave the soaked lentils another quick rinse. Then I placed the lentils in a medium pot together with three cloves of garlic, um, some turmeric powder, and water. I brought this up to a boil and then let it simmer on medium until the lentils were tender for about 20 minutes. I added a bit of water here and there as it was evaporating. In the meantime, I chopped up all my veggies. So some onion, a bit of chili, some tomatoes, carrots, zucchini, and these quite sad looking okra. Then I brought a second soup pot up to medium together with a tablespoon of vegan butter and a tablespoon of vegetable oil. I added the onion and the chili first, letting both saute for about five minutes. Then I added the tomatoes, gave that another two to three minutes, before also adding the carrot and zucchini, plus some vegetable broth and water. But yeah, then I added all my spices, sampa powder, which I found at an Indian food store in Berlin, dried coriander, and curry powder. Then I added my cooked lentils, which I know they look super dry. They're, they're soft though. Lastly, season your stew to taste with tamarind paste, which gives everything this nice sourness and a bit of sugar. I use coconut sugar here to balance that out. And that would be it. Normally in the end, you would also add some ingi fried spices like curry leaves, dried chili, mustard seeds. Um, I omitted that, so my version is very plain, but, but still really good.
on Monday, um, because you guys are getting an extra day because we didn't do Friday. On Monday, I tried baking Portuguese mini vanilla custard pies. Bastei Janata. Is that how you say it? Um, you guys have been asking me to make these since I think I started this whole cooking from around the world series. The pastéis are more so a dessert, but I heard it's okay to have them as a breakfast treat as well. Traditionally, they're filled with custard made from egg yolks, sugar, and milk. I could not, unfortunately, use my clever tomato egg yolks here, so I went with a super simple but rich and creamy vanilla pudding filling. To a small to medium sized saucepan, I added soy cream, non-dairy milk, vegan butter, vanilla, powdered sugar, salt, bit of turmeric for the yellow color, and like a teaspoon to two teaspoons of orange zest for some additional fun flavor. I brought the heat to medium, letting everything melt together for one to two minutes. Meanwhile, in a small bowl, I combined cornstarch and a fourth of a cup of non-dairy milk. Add the starch mix, keep mixing for one to two minutes. And then it should look something like this. Take it off the heat. Allow the mixture to cool off and harden a little while you're doing these next couple steps. Grease a 12 mold muffin tray with some vegan butter. Next, preheat the oven to 200 degrees Celsius and then get to rolling and shaping out your pastry dough. Super simple, I'm just using some store-bought puff pastry here, though I feel like one day I should go all out and try making my own like croissant type of dough for this. Make sure that the dough has been in the fridge up until now. We want to keep the pastry as cold as possible. Fold the sheet of pastry in half, then roll it up like so. and then divide this into 12 equally sized rolls. Right, now roll out each one using a rolling pin. Make sure both your surface and the rolling pin are floured. Fill these with the custard mix. Now here, I had the idea to also add some cinnamon applesauce mix to each one, which was delicious, but overall it made the pastries flow over. I mean, we were still able to eat all of them, but it was kind of a mess. So I baked these twice that day, the second time skipping the apple part and just making sure that the pudding would have enough space to be able to rise later. Then I bake these for 25 minutes at 200 degrees Celsius. Let the pastes rest for about 10 to 15 minutes and then serve. They're super yummy. I just don't like the fact that they rise like crazy in the oven and then they sink back down, leaving these craters in some of the pies. So I ended up filling that with um, yogurt, for example. You could also add some berries in there. But yeah, that's something I still want to figure out. So I already like this recipe, but I feel like it could be better. I think I would also love some flaky salt on these because they are quite sweet. This was honestly so fun. Let me know in the comments if you want to see another video like this. Still quite a few more countries and places and breakfasts to go through. Not only did I learn a bunch about new recipes from around the world, but I also found so much new cool music. I even created a playlist. Lastly, I'd like to thank Squarespace for today's support. A new year is around the corner, filled with new and exciting projects, many of which might need a cool and professional looking website. Go ahead and flip through all the beautiful website templates Squarespace has to offer and see what you like. You can really easily make any of these into your own or start from scratch. If it's a podcast you're working on, for example, you can embed Squarespace's audio block tools to easily display all your episodes. Or check out their analytic features to better understand your audience and really grow your brand this next year. 
Also, why not create a snazzy new logo with Squarespace for a 2022 rebrand? Go to squarespace.com slash minarome and use code minarome to save 10% on your first purchase of a new website or domain. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for watching. Talk to you guys soon. Stop.